Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, Studium Generale program. Uh, this uh, program, all you need to know about. Um, it's uh, exactly 100 years ago that uh, Franz Kafka died. Uh, one of the most influ influential uh, writers of uh, uh, last century. So uh, we thought it was a good occasion to uh, reflect on uh, his work and uh, to introduce him uh, a little bit. Uh, and uh, we. Um, invited uh, two of our uh, scientists uh, of uh, our university to, uh, to do that. So and we are very pleased that they are here. Um, Odile Heinders, Professor of Comparative uh, Literature, and Kate Huber, Assistant Professor of Dig Digital Art, Ecology and Communication. Both are working at the Department of uh, Culture Studies uh, at Tilburg University. Give them a warm a welcome. Here are Odile and Kate. Welcome, everyone. My name is Odile Heinders. This is Kate. And we have um, done a presentation on Kafka before in May when we had the uh, Knight University. Um, and now we were invited to do it again. The only difference is that um, it is now in English and it's, uh, in May it was in Dutch, but that doesn't matter so much. <laughs> what we will do is we will talk you through Kafka. We will use some of his uh, biography. We will tell something about the culture in which he worked and grew up. Uh, and of course, we will very much relate him to maybe what is happening today in politics in the Netherlands, but in Europe. And Kate is from the US. Well, uh, America is Kafkaesque as well, I think, <laughs> at the moment with Elon Musk using his money to, um, to put Trump on the position. Uh, and of course, what we try to do is to understand what is happening in this type of literature, in this specific uh, literature. Kafka wrote his work at, as you said, almost uh, uh, more than a century ago. Um, he was not that famous at the time. He published three novels um, for which he was known, but also not that well known. But afterwards, his Nachlas, uh, the, the hundred years uh, after he passed away, he is used more and more in order to make a connection to what is happening in our life, in society, and how does it relate to his work. And maybe you know his work, for instance, uh, the process, uh, the trial, or the schloss, um, the castle, or America. These are the titles of his novels. Maybe you have read them and you are familiar with a sort of strangeness, alienation that is happening in the novels, but also very much a critique on bureaucracy and also very much the theme of who am I, the protagonist, the figure, Am I lost, lost in this world? What is happening in my world? And this type of thinking that is done in, in the literature, in the novels, is very much um, uh, relevant for people to think about their own position in the society. And that is why we think that Kafka today is still so very relevant, relevant, not because we like to make literature applicable to society and politics, but we really like to sort of make negotiations, have a, a, a sort of dynamic construction between what is happening in the literature and what we see today, and how can we sort of relate to that and understand our own lives in regard to the literature as well. That is what we will do in uh, one hour. We have a lot of examples and uh, also uh, excerpts of the text. We would really like to read together to see what is in the text and what do we think about it. Uh, and then we cross politics, society, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. I'm just curious, before we get started, could I just see a show of hands if anyone here has ever felt like they've been in a Kafkaesque mo moment? Or have you ever used the word Kafkaesque? Yeah. Have you, who's read some Kafka in here? 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So more people have read him than uh, have related to the Kafkaesque moment. So um, perhaps by the end, you'll all uh, be like, oh, yes, I, I have felt Kafkaesque <laughs> before. Um, so wonderful. Excited to, to talk more about it. So let's get started with our first example. So um, who here has read The Metamorphosis? Oh, very cool. Um, all right, so uh, so this is the uh, opening of the metamorphosis, um, and it's really just kind of uh, thinking about what if one day everything for you suddenly changed. So in this uh, example, as Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. He was lying on his hard, as it were, armor-plated back, and when he lifted his head a little, he could see his dome-like brown belly divided into stiff arched segments, on top of which the bed quilt could hardly keep position, and was about to slide off completely. His numerous legs, which were pitifully thin compared to the rest of his bulk, waved helplessly before his eyes. What has happened to me, he thought. It was no dream. So we were thinking about this moment in when Gregor Samsa wakes up and everything is different. Um, and there's a lot of moments in society today, a lot of things. Um, I remember when I uh, was uh, in the US teaching and I uh, was teaching actually a writing class and it was the 2016 election. Does anyone remember the 2016 election from the U.S. here? Does anyone know? <laughs> when was that then? Yeah, does <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'm very glad. That, for those of you who might not remember, that is when Trump was elected for the first time. Uh, but all the polls said Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so I went into my writing class and I said, okay, everybody, just phones off. Let's not pay attention to the, to the election. It was an evening class. Let's just focus because it's likely Clinton is going to win and it's not going to be Trump. And uh, an hour and a half later, everybody in the class ended and we all looked at our phones and computers and everything had changed. <laughs> Um, so these are moments, and I think I've heard some folks in the Netherlands talk about that uh, when um, Geert Wilders' PVV uh, was elected, that they had a kind of 2016 moment. But there are other moments uh, in our society today when, when things change and suddenly you don't live in the world you used to live in. Um, one of those, I think, uh, for me as well, was COVID. Um, one day, suddenly, everything changed. Everything was closed. The places I used to hang out and study and work, they were closed. And after they reopened, it wasn't the same anymore. I didn't feel like going to those places anymore. Things had changed. So um, I think there's a lot of things in society that change for us uh, just through living through a pandemic, huge political uh, upheavals climate change, um, there's a lot of these things. Uh, just a show of hands, has anyone here ever had a moment when they're like, oh, I everything changed for me after that event? Yeah, so so not not everyone has had those kind of moments. So um, even, even the pandemic didn't do that for you? No, okay, <laughs> that's all right. Um, uh, Odile, have you had those kinds of moments in the I have this, that kind of moments, yeah. But, but maybe first go a bit back to the why this novella is so uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. so this is a very short uh, novella, a short story, about 100 pages in German, 1915 written. And I said, this is the beginning. Uh, so it's interesting that someone is um, waking up and then suddenly he feels I'm something else than I used to be. Yeah, he does not really... Um, uh, thought, uh, thinks that he is an insect, but uh, okay, that comes later. But then what is interesting in this story is how everyone is reacting. He is living in a small family, he has a sister, he has parents, and the first idea is, okay, I lock my door so they won't notice that I'm now in, uh, turned into an insect. And the family, okay, agrees, he's, he's doing a bit strange things, and uh, they wonder why would he, keep, why would he um, close himself off in his room, but he is doing that. Then later they notice, hey, he is not a human being anymore. He is an insect. 
And that is something that at first they sort of accept. His sister and his mother are thinking, okay, he has to eat. What will an insect eat? They will uh, find out what he has to eat. And then they even um, uh, accept that the room is starting to, to smell a bit, of course. He's an insect. He is not very uh, proper behaving himself as a human being. But then, after a few weeks, you see that at first they were sort of accepting him, even if he, was, if he is strange now. But then they are trying to isolate him more or less. Huh? They, are cl they are the ones who are closing off the door in order to keep him in prison in his room. And even more later, and this is all huh, is a short story of 100 pages, even more later they are really pushing him, um, him away. And in the end he is starving also because they are not giving him uh, food anymore. So what is interesting, I think, in this story is, of course, what Kate is saying, has suddenly the world is changed and you have to think, oh my God, how am I, uh, how am I doing this now? But it's also interesting how the world is reacting to the one who is suddenly in another, in another position. And maybe first they are interested or they are some, there's some fascination, but then in this story you see this enormous alienation, isolation and pushing away and even dehumanization. Yeah, of course, he's not a human being anymore, he's an insect. But I think the, the wonderful uh, challenge yeah, that the story is inviting us to think about not only what does it mean when the world is suddenly changed, but also how do other people behave to you and how do you behave to other people in that sort of situation. And that is, that is, I think, what, what fascinates me so much in this Gregor Samsa story. Yeah, I think uh, that's a wonderful thing about Kafka, is he will take these moments that are suddenly everything changes, uh, but then as you read the story, as you go through, you see how Gregor suddenly starts to like, well, he doesn't suddenly, gradually starts to like other foods and enjoy other things as people treat him differently um, and as they see him differently. So there's this kind of, like we were, Odile was talking about at the beginning, that there's this kind of negotiation between uh, how uh, a story is shaping you and how you're shaping a story. So back and forth between the dialogue and this, uh, and between literature and reality, but also within the story, between the character that you're sort of um, relating to and seeing yourself through and the ways that the characters, other characters are shaping them. Um, and so we see that also in society today, um, shall we, um, uh, in, how, uh, in how different systems um, shape people. So we're surrounded by stories all the time. We're surrounded by characters all the time in a way um, in which things are shaping how we see the world and how the world sees us. Um, so one example of this that we might think of is just the expansion of technology in our lives. Um, what we see from the day-to-day -day news, the algorithms that uh, aggregate news for us, what we might find interesting, what we might click on, um, a lot of those things happen behind the scenes. Um, and different scholars, um, Ruha Benjamin, is a sociologist at the University of Princeton, um, and uh, and Benjamin's done research on how algorithms actually uh, reinforce some biases that we already have in society. So, um, for example, uh, different policing systems that talk about where crime is likely to happen. Um, uh, and who is likely to commit a crime tends to reinforce racial biases. But even in medical technologies, we see this as well, um, where uh, the kinds of technologies that measure oxygen in your skin or in your blood um, are made to look through white skin. So uh, if you are not white, this is, is something that uh, you might be misdiagnosed, for example. So these are very Kafkaesque things that happen in the background um, of our lives where uh, things seem very neutral, very transparent, everything's going along, but actually society is seeing certain people in certain um, places in ways that are different than, uh, than how people might see themselves, and those environments shape them. So like Gregor Sampson, gradually became an insect that, um, I don't know, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but uh, he does eventually get swept into a dustbin and tossed out because he's, he becomes a dead bug because he 
he died in the house. So, um, so there's, uh, I'm sorry, spoiler alert, uh, for those of you who haven't yet read Metamorphosis, uh, it's still a great, uh, it's a great story because of this gradual shift. Um, but of course this happened uh, in the Netherlands as well uh, with technology that shapes people and how the society sees them um, with the Tuslach affair. Um, and uh, if we think uh, about um, what Benjamin says and, and this uh, event, um, Benjamin writes, the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities, but that are promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of the previous era. Um, so they're seemingly very transparent um, and just tools that we can use to, I don't know, uh, help us write a paper or do um, some checking on the internet that might actually change how people are seen. Um, so uh, Faith Browning was um, uh, someone who was affected uh, personally by this um, and is now in government, in the new um, uh, government. And, uh, and Browning did a um, interview with the NRSA and pointed out that uh, that when people were affected by this Tuschlach affair, when they were, um, does everyone know what that was? Just to show of hands. Yeah, mo most folks. Um, so it was basically where uh, fo folks were um, given certain subsidies by the Dutch government and then uh, there was uh, some algorithms to check those uh, things to make sure they were uh, fairly distributed and certain people were targeted um, as having uh, gotten too much subsidy and they had to then pay them back. And it was like thousands and thousands of dollars for people who were already um, uh, struggling to make ends meet in their households. Uh, and this was uh, affected a lot of black and brown communities in the Netherlands more than uh, white communities. Uh, and so it wasn't just an issue of class, but also one of race. Uh, and that is reflected also in some of the government files where people were written um, as being part of a nest of Antillians, um, a very racist slur uh, that was then in those, those files. So the ways that people were actually being shaped by the government's uh, systems and the ways that they were uh, seen in society, as Browning points out, suddenly um, she felt like a criminal in, in her own society. So these things, um, come, uh, come and shape shape how we see people, how we see the world, and, but also how people are interacting in the world. And this comes also from different authorities, um, like the government. Uh, and we see that later in, in Gregor Sampson's uh, story as um, his uh, boss comes by. Um, it's someone like directly under his boss, but uh, but uh, do you want to read the quote or dealer? Yes, and maybe to add something uh, as well. So what we are talking about is that Kafka-esque is some sort of feeling or emotion that we recognize, a term that is used often. It comes from his literature uh, and mainly from his two novels and his short stories. Uh, novella is a short uh, story, of course. Um, so the, uh, there is something in the writing that is used or can be used for a, a critical perspective on what is happening in society. But what is also interesting is that much of, the, of this literature, of this uh, writing is also ironic or playful. Mm -hmm. It's not only serious and, and very much sort of didactic, this is about bureaucracy. No, it's much more subtle and, and, and fingerspitzengefühl, uh, I like the term. And so, so he is not um, uh, overloading us with a message on bureaucracy, he is really showing it in the way he is telling. And I think that this is a fantastic passage. St we are still in Gregor Samsa. Gregor Samsa is in the room. Uh, his parents are in the living room and he is in his, um, in his own um, uh, sleeping room. And then the, the boss from his work is coming. Uh, he has, he is, has a job. He, uh, he is paid for the job. So why is, is he not on his, uh, in his office? And then this dialogue is really, really fascinating and ironic, as I uh, would say. This is what it is. The chief clerk eh, is speaking. Mrs. Samsa, what's the matter with you? Here you are, barricading yourself in your room, giving only yes and no for answers, causing your parents a lot of unnecessary trouble and neglecting, I mentioned this only in passing, neglecting your business duty in an incredible fashion. 
I thought you were a quiet, dependable person, and now all at once you seem bent on making a disgraceful exhibition of yourself. Now that I see how incredible obstinate you are, I no longer have the slightest desire to take your part at all. For some time past your, for some time past your work has been most unsatisfactory. And you see what is happening? So first he sort of, okay, what is happening here? And then he is pushing more, and then the, he's saying, ah, you had a lousy, your, you did your uh, lousy job in, uh, in your work. It was not satisfactory at all. So he's manipulating the chief. And this is funny, I think, uh, but also, of course, there is some sort of cynicism in it that, that, okay, this guy is not interested in this, what is happening here. He's not listening to, the, uh, to Gregor, and Gregor, his voice, since he is an insect, is very high, so that is why he, is not, uh, he does not dare to speak. Uh, but the chief is uh, coming to conclusions, this is happening, your work was unsatisfactory at all. This is the insect, that is what uh, Gregor looks now. He has become a dung beetle. <laughs> And one thing I think just to add to what you're saying, Odile, is about this kind of cynicism is that when I give examples about like algorithms and racism, it's really serious. Um, and I think one of the wonderful things about Kafka is that kind of satirical, ironic aspect. It's absurd. Um, this person has turned into a dung beetle. So it's such a stark contrast that you can start to kind of recognize the things that are Kafka-esque, um, the kind of uh, strange ways that authority figures can interact with people that we can start to, or the ways that we see the world and then suddenly it's, um, um, it's different. Uh, so I, I saw this um, this cartoon and I thought it was particularly Kafka-esque. In fact, uh, like looking at a war uh, scene, um, particularly in the in the Gaza um, context of people uh, being bombed and dying, and then protests, and then like, well, this is this goes too far. A kind of a Kafka-esque moment uh, of absurdity um, in in just kind of differences in how people respond to different uh, to different moments in in history. Um, so uh, that kind of irony, I think, is all, always. Um, Great, <laughs> and um, and I think uh, towards the end, as as Odile was pointing out, this of that passage we just read, um, the clerk, the chief clerk, is basically kind of coming to supposedly help Gregor, or you know, tell him um, that he's not being seen uh, as working as well. Um, uh, and he's, he wants to help him out, but ultimately then he attacks him in the end. Um, and this kind of thing uh, is, a, is a sort of absurdist, uh, Kafka-esque, ironic, um, well, I would say more satirical kind of rendition of dehumanization, something that we see um, particularly like right now in the, in the US <laughs> with the elections um, and Trump's uh, Madison Square Garden um, uh, campaign or rally a couple of days ago uh, and the things that were said about Puerto Rico. Um, so uh, by the end of Metamorphosis, even the family, even the sister who diligently tried to feed Gregor throughout the story and take care of him and treat him like her brother because that's what he, he was to her, uh, even she eventually says, no, he's not like us anymore. And she says, "We he must go cried Gregor's sister. That's the only solution, father. You must just try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. The fact that we've believed it for so long is the root of our trouble. But how can it be Gregor? If this were Gregor, he would have realized long ago that human beings can't live with such a creature, and he'd have gone away on his own cord. Then we wouldn't have any brother, but we'd be able to go on living and keep his memory in our honor. As it is, this creature persecutes us, drives away our lodgers, obviously wants the whole apartment to himself, and would have us all sleep in the gutter. So this kind of shift from, okay, Gregor's no longer our family, he's now uh, just an insect that should be disposed of. Um, and it's, I think, quite cynical that you have uh, our Minister Faber uh, next to this. So uh, the idea is this is not a human being anymore. This is an insect. And also, I'm not interested in his story anymore. I uh, want to go on with my own life. Uh, and without going too deep into politics, I think that that is here as well. And not interested in the stories, but only in... 
the procedures, in the laws, in how we can arrange it, and the particular individual uh, need of people is, is not something that uh, ministers and uh, people have to deal with. So that is, um, yeah, quite prominent here, I would say. Yeah. yeah, this was something I think that Kafka also felt sort of the dehumanization and alienation. Um, he, he was Jewish um, uh, at a time of incredible anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, and I think it, a lot of his stories do actually tap into this, uh, this dehumanization, this alienization of particular groups of people um, who no longer are seen as human. Um, they're no longer seen as part of a, a broader community, but rather one um, that doesn't belong here. Um, or uh, that's kind of the framing. So. Um, so we'll, we'll shift gears now to the trial. There, yeah, and there's another story. So we have talked about Gregor Samsa, Metamorphosis. There is another story, the process, the trial. Uh, and that is maybe the most famous Kafka story uh, about a protagonist, K. Uh, there is no name, just K. Maybe it's Kafka, maybe not. Uh, and the idea is that, again, he wakes up sometime, there are people in his room, and they are saying, you have to go to trial. There's something happening, you have to listen to us. And he has no idea what is happening, what have I done, what is the reason for this, How, where can I have an explanation. And the whole novel is about everything that happens after this morning, and he tries to understand his position, he tries to understand what are the rules, what have I done wrong, how can I um, uh, explain what, what I have done, if I have done anything at all, and so on and so forth. And the whole book long, we are following him in, in the procedures. And I think that this speaks so much to readers at the time uh, in the 1920s, but now as well, because this really is the, f the feeling that people, as you mentioned in the Toeslagenaffaire procedures have. Eh? I, I do not know exactly what I have wrong. I'm accused of something, but where can I find someone who listens to me, who explains the rule, who explains what, how we can get out of this, and so on uh, and so forth. Maybe you read this, Kate. Okay. So uh, this is when Kay is trying to uh, figure out why he has been accused. He suddenly, this, this process, this trial has taken over his life. So he goes to a lawyer to try to get some help. The lawyer had, of course, begun work straight away and was nearly ready to submit the first documents. They would be very important because the first impression made by the defense will often determine the whole course of the proceedings. Unfortunately, though, he would still have to make it clear to Kay that the first documents submitted are sometimes not even read by the court. They simply put them with the other documents and point out, for the time being, questioning and observing the accused are much more important than anything written. If the applicant becomes insistent, then they add that before they come to any decision, as soon as all the material has been brought together, with due regard, of course, to all the documents, then these first documents have been submitted, will also be checked over. But unfortunately, even this was not usually true. The first documents submitted are usually mislaid or lost completely, and even if they do keep them right to the end, they are hardly read. Although the lawyer only knew about this from rumor, this is all very regrettable, but not entirely without its justifications. It is a sort of Monty Python as well. Eh? I hope that you see it. It's ridiculous. It's ongoing. They're making fun of the procedures. And at the same time, it's very serious. This guy is lost in the procedure. Yes. His entire life has changed, and he can't get out. He's just drowning in a bunch of documents that no one will read, and they'll probably lose them. But they mean really a lot. <laughs> Um, has anyone ever felt that way, filling out paperwork? <laughs> I know I have, I don't or know. Or calling the belasting dean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and often uh, with this like, mislaying of documents, we're losing things, um, but they're really important. You have to have this paper. It's, if you don't have the paper, uh, I know. Uh, has anyone in here ever moved to another country? <laughs> 
Yes, okay, good. Uh, because immigration paperwork is often like this. <laughs> it's very important, but then it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not quiet. You need a special stamp, uh, but it has to be from a special place. Um, it can be very confusing. Uh, that's often very confusing on a personal level, um, but it's also, it can be sort of strategic in a way. Um, it can uh, become a process or as a kind of strategy to actually silence as a way of Solution. So a lot of times a, a Kafkaesque uh, thing to say is like, oh, well, this big problem that we need to solve, it's got to go to committee. And everyone knows if something goes to committee, it's going to, people are going to have a lot of meetings about it. Um, but hardly every th anything gets done right away. And that's hard with, with complex problems. It's, it's not like we shouldn't talk about these things. Um, but there are certain things that become very Kafkaesque. Um, sort of uh, climate change agreements are, are often very Kafkaesque because there, there's no one to enforce them. So people can, or nations can commit to particular uh, rulings, but then they don't actually have to, uh, as, as things evolve, as, uh, as different things change, um, they can they can back out of those and we saw that of, uh, particularly in europe um, after uh, russia invaded ukraine um, suddenly it was uh, a different kind of a story because um, of the the impacts on energy and gas at the time um, but there can also be sort of unreliable and shifting agreements on budgets uh, or different uh, different things i was hired for example on the sector plan uh, money does anyone know what the sector plan money is all right, that's good. It, it was a, a lot of money that the Dutch government said, we're going to invest in education, we're going to invest in research um, to really make the Netherlands future-proof. It's going to be the most innovative uh, country um, uh, in Europe. And uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful thing. It created a lot of jobs. It created a lot of uh, opportunities for, our, for higher education and for research. Um, and of course, the, the new government um, is not uh, very supportive of higher education. Um, they're, uh, they're cutting a lot of things, and the sector plan money was going to get cut. Um, I, of course, moved here from the US, so that was quite a big investment, um, uh, personally and professionally, to get here, only to hear that, okay, well, maybe we promised you you'd be able to stay, but now maybe not. Um, there was a lot of back and forth, those kind of shifting agreements. Um, that's very Kafkaesque. Um, sacrifice zones are very Kafkaesque, if we think about Groningen, for example. Um, uh, regions of the Netherlands uh, or of other places in the world where particular sacrifices are made for the common good, um, which often mean more urban areas. These are, these are often very uh, Kafkaesque um, things. Green energy uh, is also very Kafkaesque. It's often a paper trail more than it's actually green. Um, and, uh, and so it's sort of following the, the material implications of things, things that uh, become uh, sort of unclear or diffuse uh, as, as we're trying to solve really big problems or uh, shape our lives or just make decisions on an everyday basis. It can be very hard. I think um, that's also a lot of the, the, these kind of uh, shifts will also affect a lot of students. Um, so I don't know what you want to add. Uh, yeah, maybe something to add. I think what is most um, difficult of all the examples that you mentioned is that we cannot see anymore who is responsible. So the, uh, what you are mentioning, the sector geld, there was a plan from 2022 from the then minister, Robert Dijkgraaf of Education. Now we have another minister of Education, Apple uh, Browns. And no one still knows where did it start and now where will it end and who is responsible. And if you are coming from the United States and then ending up here and then suddenly they are explaining your contract will not be continued, who can you go to in order to make your point? Huh? So no one has really responsibility for the procedures or is accountable for the procedures. And then I sort of make you now into a, a Gregor or a K, uh, <laughs> uh, protagonist K, uh, you don't know what you should do because you don't understand it. And that is really, I think, what is so interesting in Kafka's stories. It is not a simple message, this is done wrong and who, uh, he or she is responsible, but it is sort of web of negotiations and unclear decisions and then suddenly everything is gone and you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think that that is so powerful in the stories. Yeah, yeah, it's not a story of kind of good and evil. It, there's just a constant sort of 
meandering uh, that is actually much more recognizable in life um, today, I think. Um, and I think uh, some of these uh, kind of meandering things where people aren't responsible and it, there's just sort of different loopholes, that's another thing that comes up um, in Kafka where there's just kind of an alienation uh, of people with, uh, with the documents that, that you need to stay in a certain place or to do a certain thing or to find out what's right. Um, uh, so uh, there's this passage um, talking about some of the, the um, bureaucrats who are supposedly managing managing all these papers that are so important, but they get lost and they're never read, they're filed somewhere. Um, and these people uh, are forced to spend all their time, day and night, with their laws. And so they don't have the real right feel for human relationships. And that's a serious shortcoming in cases like this. Um, in, in this passage, of course, is referring to, to Kay's case. Um, but we could also think about it in terms of just uh, struggles that we see in societies today. Um, we've seen over the past year a lot of different protests um, for uh, from the XR for climate change. Um, they're in the middle or the Palestine protests um, around universities uh, ar around the world. Um, at the top um, is, a, is a protest for missing and murdered indigenous women um, in Canada and, and the United States. Um, I don't know if folks know about that particular protest, but it's pr I think it's particularly Kafkaesque um, because it's a legal loophole about who can actually uh, go after people who commit crimes on uh, native land. So in the United States um, and Canada, um, First Nations and Native reservations are actually sovereign nations, and they have their own legal systems and their own police forces. Um, and the federal government cannot go after people on those who commit crimes on those places. Um, the tribal courts have to, but they have to go after only people who are tribal members. So there's this legal loophole, in fact, where uh, people can commit cr violent crimes on native land and they are completely um, uh, unfollowable by the law. Um, and this has led to um, huge problems, um, particularly where there is a lot of extraction of resources and people going through native lands taking, taking resources. I think it's something like eight out of 10 native women are um, sexually assaulted or murdered. Um, it's a huge problem. It's, uh, you could think of it as even a form of genocide um, in the ways that it depletes uh, native populations, indigenous populations, and First Nations peoples. So, um, but it's particularly Kafka S because there's no there's no law. It's just this this space um, where there's a lot of uh, regulation and there's a lot of agreements and there's a lot of treaties, but there's not actually any um, uh, responsibility. Again, getting back to what Odile was saying, it just kind of um, there's a lot of impunity <laughs> um, uh, amongst people um, who can do things. Uh, so that was one thing that uh, I thought was uh, that we thought was particularly Kafkaesque in societies today when we're thinking about these things. Do you want to? <laughs> No, maybe we can go to the next slide because what I liked so much what you were saying is there is no law, there is not a, uh, in the end, a particular institute that, yeah, we hope there is, but it is not functioning in the end. And that is exactly what is um, uh, explained in the process as well. Explained is the wrong term. Uh, we are in a novel. There is not a direct message, as I said, a direct explanation. But in the end, the protagonist comes somewhere, enters up somewhere, and then thinks, okay, here I find the answer. And then still it is said, this is no law. There is no one for the law. You are standing before the law, but there is no law. It's a very complicated passage, and, and interpreters and scholars are um, keeping discussing this, but that is maybe very relevant to read uh, now. You don't understand the facts, said the priest. The verdict does not come suddenly. Proceedings continue until a verdict is reached gradually. The man has come to the law for the first time and the doorkeeper is already there. He has been given his position by the law. To doubt his worth would be to doubt the law. I can't say I'm in complete agreement with this view, said Kay, shaking his head. As if you accept as if you accept it, you'll have to accept that everything said by the doorkeeper is true. But you have explained very fully that it's not possible. 
No, said the priest, you don't need to accept everything as true. You only have to accept it as necessary. The pressing few, said Kay, the lie made into the rule of the world. And this opens, of course, a whole uh, range of examples that suddenly we are in a post-truth society in which people can say, maybe I don't remember lying, or people say a lie is an alternative fact, a lie is not something that is bad. And what is interesting is that we read it already in this novel from 19, the 1920s. Huh? That, is, that is something that is in the book and that is here in our rhetoric uh, today uh, as well. Yeah, no, I think that that's very well. Uh, but there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things. I have some U.S. examples here, but I think that's uh, uh, and and I think also as we approach the U.S. elections next week, there's already a kind of idea that um, the elections, if Trump doesn't win, are somehow um, being uh, sort of. Uh, manipulated um, so there are particular groups that are already ready to like fight um, if that doesn't come out or there's certain agreements so there's no longer an actual like truth or due process so we often think of um, things as justice and democracy as things that are um, you know really uh, something that we can sort of normalize in the West um, but in fact um, those things are shifting and there is this kind of uh, space where where there are sort of there's fake news um, but but then there's also uh, that's been co-opted by uh, by the right um, uh, and used in um, by the left in very different ways so so then we actually see where there's people living in in alternative realities in fact um, and it's very hard um, to to know uh, what is true and what is uh, what is just in a in a world where there's these competing competing realities in a way yeah um, and that's something that I think Kafka brings to the fore very uh, uh, very well, particularly in this uh, ending passage, and he talks about here um, the doorkeeper, and that's uh, this parable before the law. So, if you haven't read any Kafka, I think uh, before the law is actually a very good one to to start with. Um, it's also very short. Shall we open so for some questions? Yes, then? we can also open for some questions. Oh. Yes, if there are questions, of course. Maybe you've got an example of uh, his time that you can uh, uh, trace uh, his, um, his lines? Well, as um, Kate already told you, he lived in Prague. He was uh, a Jew. He lived in uh, uh, what we now call a minor community, a, a sub-community. Uh, there was anti-Semitism anti at the time. Uh, and what is interesting is that he was um, speaking German, he was writing in German, but uh, of course in Prague there was not only German, there was this other language as well. And some people explain this feeling in his work of being encapsulated or isolated to this particular cultural situation as well, living in his own community, in his own has, uh, among his own uh, people in, in their particular language. Um, so that is, I think, what you find in his work often, that um, uh, well, the, the, the closed off or the isolation that, that he was living in. And then there are, of course, always the psychological interpretations saying that he was suffering. Um, his father was very dominant. His father was not such a nice guy. And this was why he was so afraid of all the institutions and all the systems. I'm not always convinced by that. It's interesting to read it, but I guess that huh, a writer is writing things based on, on many observations and, and experiences, uh, and everything works together in order to get here uh, in, in this fantastic literature. Um, I just, like some of the examples you've given, and also just the passages you've read, they seem sort of quite critical of. Um, like mass group decisions, like you mentioned committees and stuff. And I was just wondering like what you think, or do we know what Kafka's own political views were? Was he sort of anti-democratic or was he maybe advocating a, a shift in how we, we run um, countries from a political point of view? Or was it more sort of the like existential and philosophical aspect that he just focused on? 
Well, I don't, I think kind of to go off of uh, some of the things that Odile was saying just about his own personal biography, um, he was very, uh, he was very intellectual. So for example, um, uh, there were multiple waves of Zionism that began in the late 19th century, and he was Jewish and had been affected by a lot of anti-Semitism. So laws affected his community, and as Odile pointed out, this kind of minor space um, differently. Uh, also um, using German in a way that was very specific, um, and it wasn't the, the dominant use of German. So he's always kind of uh, obliquely, if you will, looking at society and seeing how it doesn't actually treat everyone in the same way. So when we think about democratic societies and equality, um, people are looking at that from different spaces. Um, and in a way, he was very, very curious about, um, for example, Zionism, but he wasn't a Zionist. Um, and he was, so he was curious to explore ways that, that people were pushing back um, on the ways that they were being marginalized within society, uh, but he didn't come out with clear like solutions. Like this is this is the solution. Um, this is what we should do, uh, or we should get rid of committees. I mean, I think he was uh, he was a little bit more intellectually uh, inclined than that, um, where it wasn't like this is the right thing and this is the not. I think he was actually kind of pushing against even that kind of of thinking where there would be a clear solution, but rather to uh, see the complexity in things um, and to engage with um, the, that complexity and allow it to be ambiguous, but also to uh, recognize the absurdity um, and to address that, uh, to address the, the moments where um, things become so bureaucratic that working towards a solution is actually not working towards a solution anymore. I think that's where he, he kind of um, was, was trying to intervene. Uh, I don't know if you want to, yeah. Yeah, maybe to add what is interesting is that he has not only written uh, novels, not that many novels and stories, but a lot of um, uh, letters. Uh, Arnold Grunberg, the famous Dutch uh, author, wrote something in the, I don't know, I think it was the NRC, and he said, skip the literature, read the letters of, of, Grun of, uh, sorry, of Kafka, because they are so enormously interesting. And in the letters, there is nowhere a sort of explicit political statement on democracy, or, or have, if, if that is what you are asking, but there is no, no explicit message. However, he is talking, and certainly in, um, uh, in the later letters, on uh, even leaving Europe. Ha? As you said, he's not a Zionist in thinking, oh, I should go to Israel because I am a religious Jew, not at all. But he is aware that discrimination is happening more and more often, uh, that that ha? in the 1920s is happening all over Europe. So then he is sort of playing with the idea, maybe we should leave Europe and uh, to his girlfriend, maybe we should go to, to Israel or somewhere there in order to, uh, to think about a new life. And again, some people say he did not dare to do it in the end, or some people say, yeah, he died young of tuberculosis, he, he did not ha had the opportunity. It's not explicit political, but there is an awareness of the tension that is ha growing in the 1920s, 1930s, and then we know what happened. And I would say, like, uh, even, I mean, uh, it, many of his stories, like America, the novel, um, but also the sh his short story, The Penal Colony, they were very critical um, of, uh, of forms of racism and colonialism that were creating d injustices. So I'd say, like, if he were to have a kind of platform, he was very much against injustice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but he, he didn't have clear uh, answers for, for how to get a just society. I see a hand back here, so I'll talk. Um, when did he became popular? Was it right after his death, or did it align with a certain political movement that emerged in a certain specific time? No, well, there is this fantastic uh, story. He was not well known when he, uh, when he uh, passed away. And then it was a friend, Max Brod, he was um, uh, Jewish as well, and Kafka uh, had asked Max uh, to, um, uh, uh, to burn all the, the writing, it's not good enough, th th take it away, don't, don't um, publish it. Uh, and then Max Brod did not do that, he did not kept his promise, uh, so he did publish it. 
Uh, and then uh, it's, it became known, it became famous, and even in the 1960s, we sh we sh uh, so this was the 1920s, in the 1960s it, it was enormously popular. We showed a trial, a movie, there were made several movies of his work, um, and you could say he became even more popular during the 100 years since his, uh, since his uh, passing away in 24. So this is the, yeah. the movie trailer. And it's a fantastic movie, you should see it. Thank you. I understood that uh, Kafka is uh, often related to existentialism. How do you uh, compare this with, your, with the Kafkaesque stories you mentioned? Uh, this? So how, just to clarify, how do, how do you compare Kafka's writings to the, the stories today? or? I understood that Kafka is, <coughs> is often related to existentialism. He is, is he an existentialist? Or how, what is the relationship with existentialism and, Kafka's, and Kafka? Yeah, I would say he's an existentialist. And think about the absurdity. Eh? Camus, the, the, the L'Etranger, for instance, is a story about a protagonist and a son, and he is doing something that is unacceptable. Eh? If that is uh, some of the fantastic works of existentialism, you see the connection, I would say, almost immediately to, to Kafka. And for the existentialist, he, he, was, uh, he was inspiring. And f for instance, someone like uh, Hélène Sissou today, who, who um, identifies herself as an existentialist, she mentioned there are two authors important for me, James Joyce and Kafka. So yeah, there is this bizarre world in which there is someone, a human being, living and he does not know how to do it or what it is. He is isolated. That, that is very much, I would say, existentialism. Mm -hmm. Even at the time, there was no existentialist as we know it today, since we know all the French uh, writers after the, the World War, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you think or maybe even fear that the world is becoming even more Kafkaesque? <laughs> also, when you mention these things with uh, technology, digitalization, people living in their own separate realities. Uh, yeah, what do you think of that? And um, yeah, also a question when I when I hear this story is, how do we um, move together again? Or do, how do we still find things where we can meet each other or where we can still have a normal discussion in that sense? So I, what are your thoughts about that? I don't know if Kafka also offers ideas about that in his stories or yeah just curious to hear what you think I'm, I'm actually curious do you have thoughts about that after having seen this presentation do you well some, yeah. well, some fears I, d I definitely have yeah um, where the world is going also with the Tuslag affair that you mentioned and all these things um, yeah yeah, I think uh, in creating and just being interested in uh, thinking about Kafka 100 years after his death, um, we are thinking like, well, this is with technology often, um, you know, for example, I find chatbots incredibly Kafka-esque because they never actually answer my question. Um, and then I get increasingly frustrated, uh, but um, they're still there. Uh, and I think... I think the world is, in a way, uh, through technologies becoming more Kafkaesque, maybe through more bureaucracy. Um, when we think back to, to the early um, 20th century and just thinking about the technologies that were happening then, it was kind of a, a moment when the first uh, era of industrialization had happened in the West and there was a lot of industrial society, but uh, this created an, a lot of bureaucratic structures, um, uh, sort of the peak moment of, of colonial history was uh, was ebbing and we were going into a, a, a you know the, f the second world war after which uh, many countries gained their independence but colonialization in itself was incredibly bureaucratic and there was this kind of moment when Kafka was writing and he was he was very critical of, of the colonial um, apparatus, um, as I think the penal colony. So uh, yeah, it's, a, it's absurdly um, portrays and also violently it portrays the violence of that. So I think um, uh, a lot of the the sort of thinking that was happening, the kind of bureaucratic uh, apparatuses that were at play in Kafka's time, have 
been sort of translated into digital um, into digital culture and to digitalization. So uh, people have sort of advanced by creating tools that are more efficient, but they haven't quite rethought the structures um, that were that were creating those those social hierarchies at that time in the world. Um, as we sort of know today from talking about uh, global north south, um, so that was one reason why I put sac uh, we put sacrifice zones up. Um, um, so I don't know, uh, Odile, you have thoughts on that? Uh, maybe I'm a bit more positive. <laughs> we have Kafka at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there is reading to do, and maybe also to connect it to the previous question on uh, the absurdity of life. I think there is so much irony in Kafka that is that is really funny and helpful. And uh, for instance, there are two stories. We have them later in slides, but we don't have time for it. The Hunger Künstler, that is a guy who is not eating anymore, and he is put in a cage, and then people can watch. Oh, he's even thinner. Oh, and everyone is coming. Oh, he's even thinner and thinner. And then in the end, of course, he's gone. But it is a sort of serious story yeah, that, that people are behaving ridiculous. But it also is funny in that someone decides, oh, I will do this trick and then put me in a cage. Or there is jo Josephine the mouse, the, the mouse, yeah, in English the same, uh, and Josephine can't sing at all. But everyone keeps saying to her, oh, you can sing, it's fantastic, it's opera, it's this and that. But but she is is, uh, is uh, not believing uh, or, or not being critical to herself. So she keeps on believing in this fantastic talent that she has. That is in Kafka as well. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have authors who are doing this, being serious and giving us a perspective on our world, but also playing with us, we are resilient, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I'm glad you, you turned it to a positive note. And I was, <laughs> I would say that as well, like when we can sort of disrupt the things that we, uh, that are Kafkaesque in the world, it can be um, really powerful and, uh, and meaningful. Uh, I think I saw another hand, do you have a question? You did have your hand up, right? <laughs> it's the final one, I think, because it is five. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't mean to take up extra time. I was just wanted to ask you to expand on your point regarding Camus. Um, I wanted to ask whether or not you had a specific opinion on the differences between Kafka and Camus' writing. I mean, Camus' famous line, shall I kill myself or have another cup of coffee type deal. What is the difference between their takes on absurdism? Is there a difference, or would you say that somehow they are completely interlinked and completely the same? No, I, I mean, this, this costs much more than just one minute. <laughs> but, um, there certainly is a difference, of course. And for me, the most important difference is in the style of writing. So, so um, uh, what Kafka is doing in his particular... Um, uh, stories, novellas, is is uh, really playing with the language and making it, it's not only about absurdist of bizarre uh, events, but it is also in, in the strangeness of the German. And it depends on how you are reading it. I think in, in English I'm sometimes losing it. Uh, the, the, the special type of, like, you immediately notice, okay, this is Kafka. And I think Camus, I really am a fan of Camus, but Camus is less effective in <coughs> style than in the scenery that he is, is putting. Eh? And the, the L'Etranger, as I said, with the sun and the two people, and then uh, the, the Algeria type of, of being closed off of normal life and something like that. I think that is fantastic, but it works differently because the, the type of writing, the style of writing is different. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to compare them in a paper, in whatever, an article. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks very much. I think that's a really interesting question. And I think both are, just to kind of end it, uh, both are a comment on modernity and kind of the absurdity of, uh, of the modern era and, and, um, and some of the ways that we are alienated from each other um, through the systems that we engage with every day. So um, that's why I think literature um, and Kafka in particular can be uh, a wonderful way of sort of uh, defamiliarizing that alienation <laughs> and, and trying to think of, of different uh, s ways of I interacting with our world. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much for coming. For we published here. a yeah. brief... Uh, <laughs> If 
if you want, uh, just a quick plug, we did publish an article about Kafka, kind of cause on some of the things we talked about today on Dig It magazine, in case you want to read more. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Kate and Odile, uh, for uh, taking us uh, in the reading of uh, Kafka. And I uh, hope to see you soon at uh, another event of uh, Stimulinrade. Thank you. Thank you.